Hi, this is Tom from zerotofinals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through pain management. And you can find written notes on this topic at zerotofinals.com slash pain management or in the anesthetics and ICU section of the Zero to Finals surgery book. So let's jump straight in. The International Association for the Study of Pain, or IASP, publishes a definition of pain, and this is from 2020. Their definition of pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. It's important to distinguish between two categories of pain, acute pain, which is a new onset of pain, and chronic pain, where the pain has been present for three months or more. When you're managing pain, see the local guidelines and seek advice from seniors and pain or palliative care specialists when in doubt. This section aims to help students prepare for exams and should not be used as a reference for managing pain in patients. Let's talk about some basic pain physiology. There are two aspects to the experience of pain, the sensory experience and the affective experience. The sensory experience refers to the sensory signal transmitted from the pain receptor. An example of this is when the patient says, it's a sharp sensation like a needle. The affective experience is the unpleasant emotional reaction to the pain. And an example of this would be when a patient says, it's excruciating, I can't bear it. Pain is supposed to indicate underlying or potential damage to tissues, but it can occur without any tissue damage. The physiology of pain is quite complex and there's still a lot that's not fully understood about the experience of pain. Pain is subjective, meaning that when someone indicates they're in pain, we need to accept their experience, even when there's no apparent underlying cause. Pain threshold refers to the point at which a sensory input is reported as painful. For example, different temperatures can be applied to the skin to measure the point at which heat is interpreted as pain. If someone experiences pain at a higher temperature, this indicates a higher sensory threshold for pain or a higher pain threshold. Allodynia refers to when pain is experienced with sensory inputs that do not normally cause pain, for example, light touch of the skin. This indicates a low pain threshold where even normal sensory inputs are interpreted as pain. Pain tolerance is different to pain threshold. It's more difficult to define pain tolerance and generally refers to a patient's response to pain. One person may experience pain and think little of it and carry on with their activities as normal. Another person may experience a similar pain but worry that it indicates a serious underlying illness, take time away from work and seek medical investigations and treatment. Pain tolerance varies massively between individuals and is influenced by many biological, psychological and social factors. At the most basic level, pain receptors, which can be called nociceptors, at the ends of nerves detect damage or potential damage to the tissues. Nerve signals are transmitted along the afferent nerves to the spinal cord. Afferent sensory nerves that transmit pain signals are part of the peripheral nervous system and they're called primary afferent nociceptors. Two groups of nerve fibres transmit pain. C fibres, which are unmyelinated and have a small diameter, transmit signals slowly and produce dull and diffuse pain sensations. A delta fibres, which are myelinated and a larger diameter, transmit signals fast and produce sharp and localised pain sensations. The signal then travels to the central nervous system up the spinal cord, mainly in the spinothalamic tract and the spinoreticular tract, to the brain where it's interpreted as pain, mainly in the thalamus and the cortex. 
The main sensory inputs that generate a pain signal are mechanical, for example, pressure, heat, and chemical, for example, prostaglandins. Having gone through that basic physiology of a pain signal being generated and transmitted to the brain, it's actually more complicated. When directly measuring activity in the peripheral afferent sensory nerves, pain can be experienced without any activity in the primary afferent nociceptors. Equally, activity in the primary afferent nociceptors can be detected without the patient experiencing any pain. Essentially, patients can experience pain without any clear nervous signal that should cause pain. And equally, patients with a nervous signal that should cause pain may not experience any pain. Referred pain refers to a pain experienced in a location away from the site of tissue damage. For example, patients with a heart attack may have pain in their left arm. There are several possible explanations for referred pain including nerves that may share the innervation of multiple parts of the body, for example the heart and the arm. Pain in one area amplifies the sensitivity in the spinal cord to signals coming from other areas. And activation of the sympathetic nervous system in response to pain results in pain in other areas. Neuropathic pain is caused by abnormal functioning or damage to the sensory nerves, resulting in pain signals being transmitted to the brain. Typical features suggestive of neuropathic pain are burning, tingling, pins and needles, electric shocks, and a loss of sensation to stimulation of the affected area. Let's talk about measuring pain. There are no simple, reliable ways to objectively measure the pain that somebody is experiencing. As pain is a subjective experience, it's measured by asking the patient about their perception of the pain. The two ways commonly used to measure pain are the visual analogue scale, VAS, or the numerical rating scale, NRS. The visual analogue scale involves asking the patient to rate their pain on a horizontal line where the left end indicates no pain and the right end indicates the worst pain imaginable. The distance along this line can be measured to get a numerical value to represent the pain, for example 75mm along a 100mm line. The numerical rating system involves asking the patient to rate their pain on a numerical scale from 0 to 10, with 0 being no pain at all and 10 being the worst pain imaginable. Pain can also be rated on a graphical rating scale, with a series of faces going from happy to very unhappy. This can be helpful in children or in patients with a learning disability. Let's talk about the analgesic ladder. The World Health Organization, or WHO, analgesic ladder was originally developed to help manage cancer-related pain. It's also often used for acute and chronic painful conditions. The idea is that patients with mild pain start on the first step of the ladder and when the pain is more severe or does not respond to the lower steps, higher steps on the ladder can be used until the pain is adequately managed. There are three steps to the analgesic ladder. Step 1 involves non-opioid medications such as paracetamol and NSAIDs like ibuprofen. Step 2 involves weak opioids such as codeine and tramadol. And step 3 involves strong opioids such as morphine, oxycodone, fentanyl and buprenorphine. Other medications may be combined with the analgesic ladder for additional effect and these are called adjuvants. Or they can be used separately to manage neuropathic pain. And these medications include amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, duloxetine, which is an SNRI antidepressant, gabapentin, which is an anticonvulsant, pregabalin, which is also an anticonvulsant, and capsaicin cream, which is a topical treatment from chili peppers. Let's talk about the side effects of analgesia. Medication overuse headache is a common side effect of the long-term use of analgesic medications. 
the key side effects of NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, are gastritis with dyspepsia, or indigestion, stomach ulcers, exacerbations of asthma, hypertension or high blood pressure, renal impairment, and coronary artery disease, heart failure and strokes, which can all be rarely associated with NSAIDs. NSAIDs may be inappropriate or contraindicated in patients with asthma, renal impairment, heart disease, uncontrolled hypertension or peptic ulcers. Proton pump inhibitors, for example, omeprazole or lanzoprazole, are often co-prescribed with NSAIDs to reduce the risk of gastrointestinal side effects, for example, acid reflux, gastritis and peptic ulcers. The key side effects of opioids are constipation, skin itching, which is called pruritus, nausea, altered mental state with sedation, cognitive impairment or confusion, and respiratory depression, usually only with larger doses in opioid-naive patients. Naloxone is used to reverse the effects of opioids in a life-threatening overdose, usually when the patient has respiratory depression. Next, let's talk about the use of opioids in palliative care. Using opioids to control pain in palliative patients is a specific scenario where the doses are titrated and optimised over time. This involves using a combination of background opioids, for example 12-hourly modified release oral morphine, and rescue doses for breakthrough pain, for example immediate release oral morphine solution. The rescue dose is usually one-sixth of the background 24-hour dose. For example, if a patient is getting 30 milligrams in 24 hours of modified release morphine, for example 15 milligrams every 12 hours, each rescue dose will be 5 milligrams, given every 2 to 4 hours as required. The 5 milligram rescue dose is one-sixth of the 30 milligram 24-hour background dose. If the patient requires regular rescue doses for breakthrough pain, the dose of the background opioid can be increased. The rescue doses will also need increasing so that they remain one-sixth of the background 24-hour dose. A Tom tip for you, remember that each rescue dose is one-sixth of the 24-hour background dose. This is a very common exam question and something that seniors will commonly ask to test your knowledge. The question may be something like, this patient is on 30 milligrams of modified release morphine every 12 hours. What would be the correct breakthrough dose? In this scenario, 10 milligrams is the correct answer as the patient is getting 60 milligrams background morphine every 24 hours, based on the fact they're getting 30 milligrams twice a day. Next, let's go through opioid conversion. The information here is based on the BNF, which gives approximate conversions between different opiates. It's helpful to remember the dose equivalent to 10 mg of oral morphine. The conversions are not exact and patients can respond differently to different opioids. Always check the BNF and other official reference material for accurate conversion figures. The information here may not be up to date or accurate and is only intended for studying purposes. 10 mg of oral morphine is approximately equivalent to 100 mg of oral codeine, 100 mg of oral tramadol, 6.6 mg of oral oxycodone, 5 mg of IV, IM or subcut morphine, and 3 mg of IV, IM or subcut diamorphine. It's also possible to use opioid patches for background analgesia. For example, buprenorphine patches, where 5 microgram per hour patches are roughly equivalent to 12 milligrams per 24 hours of oral morphine. And fentanyl patches, where 12 microgram per hour patches are roughly equivalent to 30 milligrams per 24 hours of oral morphine. Next, let's talk about post-operative analgesia. 
adequate analgesia in the post-operative period is vital to encourage the patient to mobilise, ventilate their lungs fully, reducing the risk of chest infections and atelectasis, and to maintain an adequate oral intake through eating and drinking. Analgesia is usually started in theatre by the anaesthetist, with regular paracetamol, NSAIDs and opiates if required. For example, regular modified release oxycodone with immediate release oxycodone as required for breakthrough pain. The surgeon may put a local anaesthetic into the wound to help with the initial pain after the procedure. Analgesia should be reduced and stopped as the symptoms improve. Next let's talk about patient-controlled analgesia. Patient-controlled analgesia, or a PCA, involves an intravenous infusion of a strong opioid, for example morphine, oxycodone or fentanyl, which is attached to a patient-controlled pump. A patient-controlled analgesia involves the patient pressing a button as the pain develops to administer a bolus of the opioid medication. After the patient pushes the button and administers a bolus, the button will stop responding for a set time to prevent overuse. Only the patient should press the button, not the nurse or the doctor. Patient-controlled analgesia requires careful monitoring and there needs to be input from an anaesthetist and facilities in place if adverse events occur. This includes access to naloxone for respiratory depression, antiemetics for nausea, and atropine for bradycardia. The anaesthetist may prescribe background opiates, for example patches, in addition to the patient-controlled analgesia. Other as-required opioids need to be avoided whilst a PCA is in use. The machine is locked to prevent tampering. Next let's talk about chronic pain. Chronic pain can be diagnosed when pain has been present or reoccurs in one or more areas over more than three months. Some studies suggest up to 50% of adults in the UK are affected by chronic pain. Common areas of chronic pain include headaches, lower back pain, neck pain and joint pain, for example in the hips or the knees. The NICE guidelines on chronic pain, updated in April 2021, separates chronic pain into chronic primary pain, where no underlying condition can adequately explain the pain, and chronic secondary pain, where there is an underlying condition that can explain the pain. There is a long list of potential causes of chronic secondary pain. A few examples are osteoarthritis, lasting pain after a traumatic injury, for example a bone fracture, migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, endometriosis, cancer, neuropathic pain, for example due to diabetes, nerve impingement, multiple sclerosis or post-herpetic neuralgia, and complex regional pain syndrome. Biological, psychological and social factors all contribute to the persistence of the pain. The physical processes that can lead to chronic pain include sensitization of the primary afferent nociceptors by frequent stimulation, increased activity of the sympathetic nervous system and increased muscle contraction in response to the pain. Chronic pain is a complex condition that can be challenging to manage. Analgesia is often inadequate and can lead to side effects and dependence. Good communication and building a relationship with the patient is an important part of managing chronic pain. In chronic primary pain, an underlying physical cause of the pain may never be found. Chronic pain may not improve and it may get worse with time. It often fluctuates with flare-ups where the pain gets worse. A big part of management is maintaining and improving the quality of life despite the pain. Patients with chronic pain require a holistic, person-centred approach to assessing and managing their condition. This involves exploring the impact on their life, discussing what they already do to manage the pain, and their ideas, concerns and expectations about the pain. 
The options for managing chronic pain detailed in the NICE guidelines from 2021 are supervised group exercise programs, acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT, cognitive behavioural therapy or CBT, acupuncture and antidepressants, for example amitriptyline, duloxetine or an SSRI antidepressant. It's worth noting that the NICE guidelines from 2021 advise that for chronic primary pain where no underlying condition can adequately explain the pain, patients should not be started on paracetamol, NSAIDs, opiates, pregabalin or gabapentin. In chronic secondary pain, analgesia may be helpful depending on the underlying cause. For example, in patients with pain secondary to osteoarthritis, the use of analgesia involves a stepwise approach to control the symptoms. The first step is oral paracetamol and topical NSAIDs. The second step is to consider oral NSAIDs if they're appropriate and consider co-prescribing a proton pump inhibitor such as omeprazole to protect the stomach. And the third step is to consider opioids such as codeine. A tom tip for you, chronic pain is incredibly common. It's worth noting these recent guidelines that clearly state to avoid basically all forms of analgesia other than antidepressants in patients with chronic primary pain. These guidelines may come up in exams, potentially asking you the most appropriate medication for a patient with chronic primary pain, and the answer would be antidepressants. This is different to chronic secondary pain, where there is an underlying condition that explains the pain. Finally, let's talk about neuropathic pain. The DN4 questionnaire can be used to assess the characteristics of the pain and the likelihood that it's neuropathic in nature. Patients are scored out of 10. A score of 4 or more indicates neuropathic pain. There are four first-line treatments for neuropathic pain. Amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic antidepressant. Duloxetine, which is an SNRI antidepressant, gabapentin, which is an anticonvulsant, and pregabalin, which is also an anticonvulsant. NICE recommend using one of these four medications to help control neuropathic pain. If it does not help, it can be slowly withdrawn and an alternative can be tried. All four of these medications can be tried in turn. Only one neuropathic medication should be used at a time. Other options for managing neuropathic pain are tramadol, only as a rescue for short-term control of flares, capsaicin cream or chili pepper cream for localised areas of pain, physiotherapy to maintain strength, and psychological input to help with understanding and coping with the pain. Trigeminal neuralgia is a specific type of neuropathic pain. However, rather than using the typical medications for neuropathic pain, NICE recommend using carbamazepine first line for treating trigeminal neuralgia. And if carbamazepine does not work, to refer the patient to a specialist. If you like this video, consider joining the Zero to Finals Patreon account where you get early access to these videos before they appear on YouTube. You also get access to my comprehensive course on how to learn medicine and do well in medical exams, digital flashcards for rapidly testing the key facts you need for medical exams, early access to the Zero to Finals podcast episodes, and question podcasts which you can use to test your knowledge on the go. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.